Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Once again, we're so glad you've chosen to worship with us and join us for this service. Uh, as you heard Stetson say at the outset of the service, this is a very special weekend in the life of our church at Chapel Street. Uh, for those of you that worship only online, you may not be aware, we have four campuses. In fact, this is the weekend we're publicly launching our fourth campus in North Aurora. We've been praying about this and uh, preparing for this, and we're very excited. God has already uh, been go gone ahead of us, and a lot of exciting things have happened. In fact, we want you to hear from Pastor Andrew, the North Aurora campus pastor, right now. Last week here at Chapel Street, North Aurora, we celebrated our very first block party. We had hundreds of guests coming through this very lot, and this morning, we open our doors to the public for the very first time. We are so excited about what God is gonna do in this community, and already we are hearing stories of ways in which He is at work in people's hearts. I would love for you to keep praying for us together as a church family that we really would be a place where people can experience God's grace, grow in their faith, and make an impact right where they are. Thank you so much to those of you who have given and prayed for this. This is an amazing moment, uh, and it's the next step of the Neighborhood Church vision that we all share together. So again, thank you so much. Keep praying for us. We can't wait to see what's ahead here at Chapel Street, North Aurora. It really is exciting. Continue to pray with us and for us as we see what God is doing uh, in North Aurora and across all of our campuses, including our online campus. Now, let's pray not only for North Aurora, but let's pray that God would speak to us through His Word. God, thank You for the way that You're moving in our midst, personally, in our own lives, in our families, in our homes, and in our church and in Your church in the world. We're so grateful to be part of it. We pray Your blessing over the folks at North Aurora. God, uh, in, continue to increase uh, their passion for you, their love for each other, and that their witness in that community and that part of the, your world uh, would bear much fruit. Now, Lord, we come to your word and we ask you to speak to us. We confess that sometimes we resist and sometimes we don't want to hear, but we need to hear from you, Lord Jesus, the living word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, so we're in our series uh, called Following the King on the Gospel of Mark. If you've missed any of these sermons, you can go back online and watch them. We encourage you to do so. We're working our way through not every single verse, but the major movements uh, in Mark's Gospel uh, to understand who Jesus is. That's the central question and what it means for us to follow him as our king today. And, but I want to begin by asking you a question. And I, I, I think I presume to know the answer, but I want you to honestly answer right where you are in your own heart. How receptive are you to the Word of God? I mean, really. How ready are you to receive the Word of God right now into your heart? Maybe you come to this, this moment that you're watching this and you feel distracted. Maybe you feel uh, you've got some other questions. But how receptive are you really? Let's be honest. There are some things in our lives we're very ready to receive. We're interested in, we're tuned in, we're dialed in. <laughs> the other day I was watching ESPN uh, flipping through channels and I saw they had a 30 for 30 on the 1985 Chicago Bears, which I have watched, my wife reminded me, at least a dozen times before. But I sat down, rewound at the beginning, and watched every minute and was rewinding things that I'd seen a dozen times before. My, and my wife was on the couch going, you've seen this, why are you keep rewinding it? Because I love it so much. It's like my childhood and I have to watch all of it and relive it. And so I was tuned in and I'm ready to talk about that. I'm ready to receive ESPN, what you want to give to me through the 85 Chicago Bears. But then on the other hand, when my son Ben sits down and wants to talk to me about the Marvel Universe, because I ask him questions about where does this movie fit, what's the timeline, and he goes, Dad, we've talked about this a dozen times, and he starts to lay out the Marvel timeline, I'm not all that tuned in, to be honest. I check out, I don't understand what he's saying, and I ask the same questions over and over again. That's just a silly example, but the truth is, some things in our life we're tuned into, we're ready to receive, and there are other things that we're not. But when it comes to the Word of God, it's the most important thing we could ever receive. So I want to ask you again, how ready are you to receive what God wants to say through His Word? 
because that's precisely what we're going to look at in this parable Jesus told uh, from Mark's, Mark chapter 4. We call it the parable of the sower. It shows up in Matthew and Luke as well. It's a central parable, crucial to understanding what life in the kingdom and following the king means. C.S. Lewis called it the, the parable of the sower, the parable of parables. It's the key that unlocks how we receive all of the parables. So let's read uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil, when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since, since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil, and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right, again, probably a very familiar passage to many of you. It's one of only two parables of the more than 40 Jesus told. It's one of only two that he takes the time to explain in detail to his disciples. There's a reason for that. If Jesus stops and takes the time to explain in detail, we should pay attention, and we're going to do that. But I want to draw your attention first to the way this, this curious parable that ends, this phrase Jesus uses when he says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What exactly does he mean by that? Were there a lot of people uh, in the crowd that day who didn't have ears? Was Jesus speaking to people that were missing their ears physically? No, no, of course not. That's not what he's saying. He, it's, a, it's a phrase he uses quite frequently, actually. He's talking about the way in which we listen. In fact, in verse 3, he says, listen, behold, listen and look, he's saying. Listen with your spiritual ears. Look with your spiritual eyes, because this story has spiritual meaning. This is actually a phrase Jesus uses quite frequently. In fact, in Luke chapter 8, verse 18, Take care then how you hear. Take care. Be careful. Pay attention to how you hear. For the one who has more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. What does that mean? We'll come back to that in a little bit. But Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So there's something crucial in the way that we receive, that way that we hear the Word of God, what God is saying to us. And this is what the parable of the sower is all about. Let me put it to you this way. The kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, moves forward in our hearts and in the world based on how we hear God's Word, how individual hearts receive the Word of God. It doesn't come by force. The kingdom doesn't come by coercion. The kingdom doesn't come by public policy or laws or elections. The kingdom comes like a tiny seed. In fact, I've got a little bag of seeds right here. The kingdom comes like this, Jesus says. In fact, this is a pumpkin seed, so just so you can see it. Like a little seed taken into a human heart where it's invisible. It grows. You plant a seed in the ground and it's not visible for a while. Things are happening beneath the surface and it grows imperceptibly. That's how the kingdom comes. But it begins to produce something and transform a life. This is not the way earthly kingdoms work, is it? Earthly kingdoms don't work on this. Earthly kingdoms work by, by gaining a hearing, gaining a following, getting followers and listeners and likes and, uh, and people to get on board with your mission and your message. But Jesus' kingdom comes by those who give a hearing, those who have ears to hear and receive the seed and slowly God begins to do something. That's how he changes the world. The kingdom of God comes to those who are willing and open enough to hear the unlikely, the beautiful, and the amazing life-transforming message of the gospel. Thoughtful, honest, humble listening and reflection are part, then, of what it means to live in the kingdom. And let's, just, let's talk now about what we're going to call the secret. The secret. Have you ever wondered why Jesus told so many parables? Jesus told so many stories. You never wonder, he's a master storyteller. And maybe you've wondered, why so many stories? 
Why these stories, Jesus? I mean, maybe you think, well, that's kind of a, a great teaching tool, that all good teachers are, are often good storytellers to illustrate their point. And Jesus certainly was the master storyteller, the master teacher. But is that all that's going on? He's just really good at telling stories? Or is there something more happening here? His disciples actually asked him this question. They asked Jesus, and in his answer to their question, why do you teach in parables, that gives us some insight into what the kingdom is really all about. Let's look at verses 10 through 13. And when he was alone, so he's told the story of the sower, and now he's alone with his disciples, and they've withdrawn, and they're going to ask this question. Those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given, this is an amazing phrase, the secret of the kingdom of God. What does that mean? But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? This is a great question. Jesus is saying this parable we call the parable of the sower is a key to understanding all the parables. Well, again, why C.S. Lewis called this the parable of parables. But this phrase, the secret of the kingdom of God, is fascinating. What, what is he saying? I mean, think about that for a minute. What if you were one of Jesus' followers, and he says to you, I'm telling you the secret of the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you be like, whoa, wow, Jesus, we're in on the secret? You're letting us in on the secret of the kingdom? That is so cool. We're insiders. We have inside knowledge. It sounds like he's saying that, but for those on the outside, everything's in parables. Wait, what? It sounds almost like Jesus is saying, I'm letting you in, but I'm going to intentionally be confusing to everyone else. Is that what he's saying? Is he saying, you get the secret, but I'm going to just mess with all the, 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 the crowds? Well, that doesn't make sense. Is that what Jesus is saying? Doesn't he want all people to hear and understand and receive the gospel? Of course. He quotes Isaiah 6, verses 9 through 10, uh, to so, show that he's fulfilling his prophecy. And in this passage, Isaiah is saying, there will be those who cannot and will not hear. To drive home his point, here's, here's what he's saying. If you genuinely and humbly seek Jesus, you will be granted access and insight on an increasing basis of his kingdom. This is what he means, he says, to those who have, more will be added. To those who have not, what they think they have will be taken away. It's a simple principle. If we're humble and open and, and ready to receive what God wants to give us, then he's, we're going to get more. But if we're resistant and distracted and not paying attention, then what, even what we have, we will lose. In other words, the same sun that hardens clay, you've heard this saying before, also melts wax. It has everything to do with our condition, our recept receptivity to the seed that God wants to plant in us. The secret of the kingdom is that God's plan for growing it is like a tiny seed. And it has everything to do with how we receive it. And by the way, if you're wondering what, what does kingdom means, you know, in the Lord's Prayer we pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what, what, does, what is the kingdom exactly? That's not language we use very often uh, today. The kingdom simply is this. The kingdom is the blessings of the rule and reign of the king, Jesus Christ, on earth. That's the kingdom. We don't always see it, but Jesus says it has come. We will fully realize it when he returns. But we're living in a time in which the kingdom has come. Wherever we experience the blessings of the rule and the reign of Jesus, living kingdom life his way, that's the kingdom. And it begins like a seed sown in human hearts. All right, next, after the secret, the sower. In this parable, Jesus is describing what he himself is actually doing. He's, he is sowing seed, even in telling this parable. He's casting out seed into human hearts. He is the sower. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 38, where he says, Let us go to other towns, for I must preach the gospel there also, for that is why I came. He's the one who's sowing seeds. He was doing it then, and he's doing it still today. In fact, he's doing it right now, in our own hearts, in this moment, through his word. 
Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. Very simple statement in Matthew's account of the parable of the sower. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. This phrase, the son of man, we've talked about this in the past. This is a reference of the book of Daniel. It's one of the common ways Jesus used to refer to his divinity. We think of it as a reference to his humanity, but actually, by quoting he's the son of man, he's saying, I am the divine one. The sower is Jesus. Now, we become fellow sowers with him in the world once we receive the seed of the gospel in our own hearts. We too are sharing the good news, the word. But he is the sower in this parable, casting out seed. Now, next, the seed. Working our way through the elements here in this story. What is the seed? The seed is the agent of change in this story. The seed contains within it all that's necessary to grow the, the, the plant, the, in this case, a pumpkin plant, and produce pumpkins, this little tiny seed. You ever think about that? You, you, maybe some of you love to grow things. You buy these little packets of seeds for your garden. You look in this little tiny seed. All the potential for a massive flowering plant to produce fruit is contained in one little seed. I, I like to go out to Johnson's Mound and, and run up and down the hill and do a workout which, uh, nearby here, and there's all these little acorns on the ground this time of year. And I think about massive oak trees, massive trees, which are all over that property, in this one little tiny seed of the oak tree is the acorn. And, and this is what Jesus is saying. The seed is the Word of God, and all that is necessary for what God wants to do in your life is contained in His Word, in the Word of the Gospel, His message. Look at chapter 4, verse 14. The sower sows the word. Simple statement, but that's the seed. The word is the seed. That Jesus is sowing the word of his word in our lives. That's what he's after. This means the kingdom, the blessings of the rule and reign of Jesus, come into our lives in direct relation to our receptivity to the word of God. Remember the question I asked you at the beginning? How ready are you to receive God's word today? Really, how ready are you to receive it? All that God wants to do in you is contained in his word. Now, Jesus is the living word. We know in Isaiah, we're told in Isaiah 55 that God's word goes out. It does not return void. And in, in Hebrews chapter 1, we're told that long ago God spoke through the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his son. And in, in 1 Timothy, we're told that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And then in John chapter 1, Jesus is the Word made flesh. So He Himself is, it's not just words on a page. He's the living Word, and His Word to us is living and active, a living seed, if you will. God's blessings come into our lives primarily through His Word. It's much, much more than mere information. If you've, we... We're in a series uh, called Living Hope in the first and second Peter uh, earlier this year. Let's look at first Peter chapter one, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. There it is. Peter tells us this imperishable seed is the word of God. And it's the agent of change that has caused us to be born again. We've been born again, made new, not improved, not remodeled, but changed radically new. How? By the living and abiding Word of God. That's the seed, Jesus says, the sower comes to sow in our hearts. The kind of seed you sow determines the kind of harvest you get. This is the time when we like to go apple picking, right? Some of you are uh, excited about that. It's coming up. Maybe you like apple cider donuts more than picking apples. Uh, when I was a kid, I would always want to find the rotten ones and throw them at my sisters, but that was a different story. We'd go out to the apple orchards nearby, and, and we're going to do that as a church staff coming up just to enjoy each other. And, and you, certain kinds of seeds produce certain kinds of fruit, right? So and that, that, there's a certain kind of harvest. You, you, don't, you don't get oranges from apple seeds. We all understand that. Jesus is saying the kind of harvest you get depends on the kind of seed that is sown. And the kingdom harvest is a harvest of righteousness, changed lives, forgiven sin, hope secure for, for all eternity. And that only comes through one kind of seed, the Word of God. So we're, what are we trying to sow here? What kind of harvest are we after? Not just a harvest of compassionate deeds in the community, of good service and good works. We want to do that, but those accompany the gospel, the word of God, the message of God to us. The seed has produced this harvest. Think about it for a minute. This seed, the word of God, has produced this harvest in every generation, in every culture, in every civilization throughout human history. And it's doing it still. God has been sowing the seed of his gospel 
throughout the world and throughout history, across cultures and generations, always producing the same kind of harvest, forgiven sin, transformed hearts, and hope for all eternity. So that's why here at Chapel Street, we don't get this perfect all the time, but we want to center everything we do on the Word. It's, it's all the potential for change is bound up in the seed. Look at Psalm 19, verses 7 through 8, speaking of the Word of God. For the law of the Lord is perfect, that's what it is, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, that's what it is, making wise, that's what it does, the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, what it is, rejoicing the heart, what it does. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's word is perfect, sure, right, and pure. And what does it do? What does it produce in us? Reviving our soul, making us wise, giving us joy, and enlightening our minds and our eyes to see. Just one simple example uh, throughout the scriptures of what the word of God when taken in, when received, does in us, produces in us. Okay, now, the, really, the parable, the, the heart of the parable, is not about the sower or the seed. Those are critical. Jesus tells us about the parable to help us focus on the soil. In fact, you, you could make the argument that this parable ought to be called the parable of the soils, because that's the focus. The, the, the sower is Jesus, and the, the seed is the word, which is the, the powerful change agent. But the, the part that we need to focus on for our sake is the soil. Because the variable in this parable is not the seed. The seed is unchanging. First Peter, we read verse 23, and verses 24 and 25, all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flowers that fade. The grass withers, the flowers fail, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So the seed does not change. It's unchanging. The sower is always casting seed. The variable in the parable, that what changes, is us. The soil, the condition of the soil. Again, that's why we ask the question, how ready am I to receive what God wants to do through his word in my life, in your life? There were different soils in the crowd that day. Think about Jesus. He's in the boat. Uh, he's teaching the crowds. He's looking at the multitudes of faces. And he knows among that crowd there's different kinds of, there's different life conditions. There are people there that are hardened skeptics. There are people there that are broken and longing for any glimmer of hope. There are people there that are just curiosity seekers. They're just, you know, they're just on their way somewhere else and somebody invited them. There are people there that wonder if they, if they could ever be forgiven. There are people there that are self-righteous and think they're just fine and everything in between. And you know what? Right now, the same thing is true. Some of us are curiosity seekers are looking for information or want to see want to be wowed by some miracle others of us are hardened and skeptical others of us are wounded and broken Jesus sees them all and these soils that he's going to describe get right at the heart of those issues let's look, let's read verses 15 through 19 and these now he's explained the parable to his disciples and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown and when they hear satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them and these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So you've got the three kinds of soil here. Those, the ones along the path, the ones sown on rocky ground, and the ones sown among thorns. There's four soils. We'll get to the fourth one in a minute. But these three describe three heart conditions of human lives. So the challenge for us is to do a kind of soil sample, an analysis of the soil condition of our own hearts. You know, it's maybe not incidental that when we think about the Genesis account, God made us in his image, but he made Adam from the, the dust, the dirt, the stuff of earth. God, God loves dirt. God loves soil and dirt and earth. He made us from it and breathed life into us 
And Jesus here is describing what happens to our, our hearts over time and how receptive we are to what he wants to do in us. And I think it's for us to stop and think, what's the condition of my heart? So I'm going to invite you to do that right now. As we go through these in detail, be asking yourself, what, what soil am I? Lord, what's the honest condition of my heart? If you're with somebody watching that you know and love and trust, maybe you share with them as we go the condition of your heart. You, you help identify it together. Of the four kinds of soils, only one produces a harvest, a harvest of the kingdom. And three of them have to do a lot with where we find ourselves. The first, verse 15, the soil that, if we go back there, a couple of passages back, there we go, that fell along the path. This is the hard heart. This is the, 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 the heart that's hardened. The path is packed down. We've all seen this. We've all walked along a path that's packed down hard earth and like you think nothing's going to grow there. The seed falls on that soil and it just stays there and birds come and pick it up. And, and Jesus connects that to Satan plucking away the word of God. Nothing grows here because it's hardened, resistant. It's difficult to penetrate. Nothing can get through. The path is hard. Why is it hard? Well, for obvious reasons. One is people have walked on it over and over again. They've trampled it down, packed it down hard. Think about that. Maybe, maybe your heart is hardened because you feel like you've been trampled on in life. You've been walked on. Maybe even you feel like you've been walked on by some church people. Maybe you feel hardened because you've been around the church and you've been wounded. You've had your heart stepped on and you felt like, I'm not doing that again. So you harden yourself against being hurt again. Maybe it, you're hardened by skepticism. You just got a lot of questions and the answers you've been given seem trite or, or ridiculous or cliche and you think, this, I don't know if any of this is true and you become hardened to the claims of the gospel. Maybe we have hard hearts because, frankly, we just don't want to hear it. I kind of like living my own way and I know what, if I, I'm gonna, God's going to make me feel guilty and I really don't want to hear that. There's all kinds of reasons our hearts become hardened whether hardened by pain or by presumption or by some prejudice or, or some past, God wants to break up the soil of hardened hearts, the soil of your heart. Now, let's look at verses 16 through 17 once more. Uh, well, no, sorry, stay there. Here we go. The word that is sown in them are sown on the rocky ground. The rocky ground, if, this is the, if the path is the hard heart, the rocky ground is the shallow heart. Because what happens in this soil is they immediately receive with joy, Jesus says. There's at first good signs. Yes, I like this. I want to take this in. I, I, I love the, the fact that Jesus loves me and wants to forgive me, and I, 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 I'm all for it. But there's no depth. Nothing goes very deep. And in fact, in Palestine in Jesus' day, most of the soil was about two inches deep above a hard bedrock of limestone. So it took real work to cultivate deep soil. The, the natural condition of most of the ground was not deep. And you know, I think the natural condition of most of our hearts is not that deep. There's a shallowness, and we certainly are living in a culture of shallowness. You know, tweetable phrases, sound bites, Instagram pictures that fade away real quick. We're, we, we skim. It's, I, I, I find myself doing this. It's like we're skimming across the surface of life, not really ever settling in and going deep. Deep conversations seem rare. We don't have time for them. We're in a hurry. Deep connection, where we share what's really going on. I remember years ago, I was walking uh, across the church lobby, and uh, I saw a man who I knew kind of casually, and I said, hey, uh, how you doing? Uh, how you doing? And he said, uh, you really want to know? And I said, yeah, I really want to know. And he stopped, and he said, okay. And he launched into telling me about some deep, deep pain in his marriage and family. And he said, I'm sorry to dump that all on you, but I decided I was going to come to church today, and I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm going to tell the truth about what's going on in me, and you're just the first person that asked, Pastor Jeff, sorry. But it struck me that how rare that is. I'm not going to pretend anymore. How many of us pretend? We just skim. We don't really go deep. And Jesus is describing the shallow heart here. And what happens is everything is fine until what? Until pain comes, until persecution comes, until hardship comes. That's when the shallowness is revealed. Boy, that's been true in my life. I feel fine. Everything's fine until there's some conflict, some tension, some pain. And then I realize that there's no root, there's no depth, and it withers, and it fades. This is the condition of most of our hearts left to ourselves, if we're honest about it. Notice that they first receive it with joy because there's no root, it, 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 it doesn't last. I've known so many people in my years as a youth pastor and even since, so many people who once professed joyful faith in Jesus and now have withered away. 
spiritually speaking. What happens to our faith when life gets hard? What happens to your faith when life gets hard? Do, you, do the roots go down deep and hold on? Or do you begin to question it at all? Uh, in fact, frankly, COVID has revealed the soil condition for many shallow hearts. I've seen it as a pastor in my life, in the people that I interact with, in our church family. For many people, there was a shallowness that wasn't evident because things were fine until there's some tension, some trial. But for many others, it's caused us to go deep. If you speak, take a marriage analogy for a minute. I want to just settle in on this shallow heart for just one more minute. If you ask me, Pastor Jeff, how's your marriage? And if I said to you, well, I, I, you know, we've had some problems. In fact, uh, we, we weren't getting along, so I actually haven't talked to her in over a year. We don't see much of each other. I mean, we were married in 1993 in August. We got married. I said I do. I have the license. I have the marriage license. But I, I, we don't talk, and I haven't seen her. You'd say, well, your marriage is a sham, and you'd be right. But for many, many people, that's how they approach their spiritual life. Oh, I believe in God. I prayed some prayer once upon a time, but I, I don't talk to him much. There's not much going on. Depth, soil, heart takes time, it takes effort, and we live in a shallow culture. Mindless entertainment, quick fix, instant gratification, occasionally flashes of joy, but don't last. All right, one more, one more soil sample. The, that that falls among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in. This is interesting. Jesus spells this out for us. The cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and desires for other things. Boy, he couldn't be clearer there, could he? The, the, the seed that falls among the thorns, this is the cluttered heart. Interestingly, it's not a hard-packed heart, and it's not necessarily a shallow heart, because there's already stuff growing there. Weeds, thorns, thistles. There's just no room for the seed to take root. There's no space. So nothing else can grow because it's already full. Boy, of all the, the soils, the three, these three soils, I mean, they all are relevant to us, but I think this describes our culture more than anything. The cluttered heart, the distracted heart. There's, do you ever feel like the life that God wants you to live is just, a, it's, it's just choked out because you're so busy? There's so much going on all the time? It might surprise you to think that even pastors feel that way sometimes. Maybe you think, well, pastors, you, you guys just pray all the time, right? Read your Bible and have spiritual thoughts all day. Actually, no. <laughs> I get distracted and I, and I get cluttered, just like you. And Jesus says, what, what, what the thorns that, that choke it out, the stuff that's already growing is three things. The cares of the world, worry, anxiety, stressed out about what's going on in my life. The deceitfulness of riches, Oh, that describes our culture. The, the, the lure of wealth and stuff and material gain and achievement and accomplishment and just the desires for other things. I, the truth is, I don't want to admit this, but I desire other things more than the kingdom sometimes. And that chokes out the life that God wants to grow in me and in you. Uh, I read a book recently I would recommend to you a couple of years ago called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by an author named John Mark Comer. Interestingly, John Mark, that's the, uh, that's the name of the author of our gospel, John Mark. Uh, John Mark Comer, pastor in, in, in Portland, Oregon, and, and a great writer on the spiritual life, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I recommend it to you. If you, if you feel like this is me, I'm the shallow heart, that's a great book for you. And frankly, our phones. Is, is your phone a hindrance or a help to your spiritual life. Certainly, Bible app, which I use, uh, podcasts with spiritual content, uh, worship music can all be very helpful. I'm not saying the phone is always bad, but if I'm honest, that's a small percentage. Most of the time, my phone is a distraction. It's, it's, not, it's a hindrance, not a help to my spiritual life. I remember years ago, I met a man in our church who was very, very generous to the work of God, and he uh, described to me how uh, early on in his career, when he began to have success and, and grew and sold a couple businesses, that he uh, was acquiring stuff, including properties and land and uh, homes and all the stuff that goes with it. He needed, some of them were tax write-offs. Some of it just had so much money. What am I going to do with it? Maybe you'd like to have that problem. Um, and he said, you know, it became, I was so stressed out when I had property and vacation homes and, and, and you know, 
boats and all this different stuff. He goes, I was always stressed all the time about taking care of it, maintaining it. And it became a giant distraction to me. <laughs> I laughed and said, well, I'll trade distractions if you want. You know? But the truth is, he was saying, as he began to sell those things and trim down and begin to give more to the kingdom of God, he said, I felt more spiritually liberated and free, and I felt more alive and more connected to God than before. Now, there's nothing wrong with having stuff, but things can also clutter our heart as well. So there it is, the hard heart, the shallow heart, and the cluttered heart. Which are you? Which, be honest, which one is, is describes, maybe you think I'm all three. Well, maybe so. There's probably one that's more acute, more presenting. It's worth thinking about. Maybe write that down. If you've got your mark journal out, write down, this is me. This is the heart. Circle it and, and say, this is my heart right now. And let that be the beginning of a prayer that you pray to God. Because there's a final soil condition, uh, the seed that falls on good soil. The word does not bounce off the surface because it's not hard packed. It does not uh, just go shallow and have no root and then wither and die. And it, it's not choked out by other things. It goes down deep. It takes root and it produces a harvest. This is the harvest. Jesus says, when the seed, the seed, the, the unchanging seed of the word of God, the life-changing power of the message of the gospel takes root in a human life, something miraculous happens. Let's look at uh, chapter 4, verse 20. But those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. So hearing and acceptance go together and bear fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Okay, so it's not just physically hearing. Now, I don't just hear with my ears. It's, this hearing is a way of receiving. Remember, be careful how you hear. T watch, take care how you hear. Listen, he who has ears, let him hear. Meaning take in and accept, receive the word of God. Now, some of the things in God's word we want to receive. Forgiveness, hope, purpose, blessing. Oh, give me that, Lord. But self-sacrifice, a life of, of radical generosity, sexual purity, faithless to God, uh, loving our enemies, some of those things, ah, do I have to take it all in? Yes, Jesus wants to do so much in your life, but you don't get to pick and choose to receive the word that he wants to plant in you. So we hear it and accept it, receive it, even if it's difficult, and take it in and we begin to bear fruit. It always produces something in us, not always immediately. In fact, for many of us, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the subterranean level that we don't see for years. I, I, a man at our stadium service last month came down to be baptized on the spur of the moment, walked straight down to me and said, I need to be baptized now. And I've known this guy. I knew that he was resistant to God. I knew that for a number of years he was holding out and keeping God at arm's length, that he was the hard-packed heart. But in that moment, he was finally ready to receive. And God is going to do, it is doing miraculous things in his life over time. The typical yield, by the way, for a farmer in Jesus' day was if they, if, if five to ten times was, was what, what they hoped for. Fifteen times to twenty times would be a bumper crop like the, the crop of a lifetime. So when Jesus says thirty, thirty would be almost unimaginable. Thirty times, thirty-fold would be incredible, like they'd brag about that for the rest of your life. Sixty-fold, that's, that's crazy talk. That's ridiculous. That's beyond comprehension. A hundred-fold, now we're in the ludicrous category. What's his point? His point is God is going to do more through his word than you can possibly imagine. He's going to do more through this, this, this little seed called the gospel in your heart, in your life, and for all eternity than you can comprehend. This is Paul's prayer in the Ephesians, right? To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or even imagine. But it's not always on our timeline. And it's not always in our way. Nevertheless, when a heart is ready to receive, the seed never fails to produce a harvest of righteousness. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. The blessing of being set free from sin and a blessing of a life lived under the rule and reign of Jesus. That's the harvest. That's what we're after. So again, what kind of soil are you? Really, what kind of soil are you? you think about this, the sower comes to sow his seed, and he's liberally, he's casting it out, right? Some of it, where is it falling? Some of it on hard hearts, some of it on shallow hearts, some of it on cluttered hearts, and some of it on good soil. One more little interesting tidbit from Jesus' day. I didn't know this until studying for this. Did you know, in our day, we plow the ground first and then plant the seed? 
In the time of Jesus, the sower would go into a field and sow the seed and then come and plow up the ground. So he's sowing the seed liberally because he wants to get it all over. The hard places, the shallow places, the rocky places, the cluttered places, and then he's going to come and plow up the ground. It came after. Here's what that means. Jesus right now is sowing seed. And the Spirit of God is moving behind to plow up the hardness of your heart, to pull out the rocks that are in our lives, the shallow soil, to, to, to deepen it, and to pull out the, even the most stubborn weeds. I don't know about you, but I've got some stubborn weeds in my backyard. And we've got those in our hearts too. Jesus wants to pull those out. Praise God for the sower, who not only sows seed, but plows up the ground in our hearts. He wants to do that in you and in me. So I'll ask you once more. You do not have the capacity to change the condition of your heart. The soil can't change itself. It needs someone to plow it up, to weed it, to deepen it. And that's what God wants to do. All we can do is be honest about where we are. So I ask you, some of you are going to hear this word, this very word today, and it's just going to bounce off. You know, it's not making any, any dent. You think you already know. Others of you are going to take it and you go, oh, that's good. I, I got to think about that. I got to really, I'll come back to that. And you put it away and you never will. You forget about it entirely. But others of you are going to hear and take it in. And that's going to go down deep. It's going to penetrate your heart. And you're going to find out that you're forgiven and free. That all those wounds and bags you carry, God has taken those away. It's going to change your relationships. It's going to change your, your vision of eternity. It's going to change about what, you, what matters to you in life and what you're pursuing. This is what God wants to do. Praise God for the great sower of the seed, friends. So if you're watching right now, paying attention, I want you to take your hands, turn them up with me right now, right where you're sitting, right where you are. Turn your hands up as a posture of I'm ready to receive and pray this prayer with me. Father God, I confess to you that sometimes I'm hard-hearted. Sometimes I'm just skimming over the surface of life and I'm shallow. And my life is certainly cluttered and I feel distracted. But right now, God, I want to receive what you want to do. I know there are parts of my life you want to change. And I know that I resist it, but I want to receive your word. I want to receive what you want to do in my life. Help me, Lord, to be good soil. And I trust you, the sower of seed, will plow up my heart and produce in me what only you can do. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. It's so good to be reminded that we need to put ourselves in a posture to receive God's word, to not just hear it and understand it, but to allow it to change our hearts and change our lives. So uh, we're going to be continuing this conversation, Pastor Jeff and I, in our podcast, our For Where You Are podcast. You can find that anywhere uh, after Monday. Uh, you can find that anywhere where you download your podcast. I encourage you to, to check that out and listen. But as we go out from here today, church, I want to bless you with the words. May we be a church, may we be a people to receive God's word, allow it to change our lives, and bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Bless you, church. Have a great week.